back. Always enjoy, always enjoy being with you all and uh, happy to have an opportunity to present. I do have to give you a bit of a disclaimer tonight. I'm a little under the weather, and um, uh, but that leads me to my my first travel photography rule, which is don't schedule a presentation to a group of people within two weeks of returning from a long trip uh, <laughs> because you just never know what your situation is going to be. And I got back uh, from a two week trip to Vietnam and Cambodia Saturday a week ago, and uh, which involved a 32 hour trek home and four flights and uh, and a 12 hour time difference, which I guess is the biggest, you know, jet lag difference you can have, plus crossing the international date line. So I was pretty wiped out when I got home Saturday and then woke up just feeling like I'd been hit by a bus. And I've been dealing with an upper respiratory tract infection and a bacterial sinus infection and uh, just started on steroids and antibiotics on this Friday. So uh, I tell you all that not for sympathy, but just to say that um, if I sound like my head's in a bucket, that's why if I wander off aimlessly somewhere at some point, it's because I'm full of decongestants and and, and uh, cough suppressants and filled my head with nose spray and uh, it still doesn't seem to be reaching most of this, but um, I think, I think it'll, it'll work out, but I just kind of wanted to let you know if I'm a little off my stride or seem a little sound a little strange, that may be why. Let me go ahead and share my screen here and, and, and we're going to jump in. Uh, as usual, if anybody has any questions, can everybody see that okay? That's good. Yes, okay. it's working. All right, I've, I've got chat open and and that and stuff. If anybody wants to ask questions there, I'm happy to answer questions afterwards or anything. But otherwise, I'm just going to, to, to run through this. And I've, I think I've given a couple of presentations for you all on a couple of subjects in the past. And you know, I don't just generally um, you know jump right to here's some little tips and tricks. We're going to do a lot of that tonight. But uh, I, I like to put the, the, the topic in context because with travel photography in particular, um, there's some controversy as to what really counts as travel photography. So we're going to get into that. So we'll start here. I want to do a little, you know, what is travel photography? Because it, there are issues there that I think are at least worth thinking about. I want to talk a little bit about uh, planning and setting expectations before you go on a trip. And I can't help but take a few minutes to talk about composition because composition is important in, in any kind of photography, but in travel photography, uh, there are just a few little things that can go a long way uh, to improving your pictures. And then just a whole raft of kind of practical tips and techniques and things uh, that I use to try to get better uh, travel photography pictures. So starting at the beginning, now, you know, what, what is travel photography? Well, it's, it, it's pretty basic, right? It covers many genres of photography, scenics, architecture, people, wildlife, uh, documentary street photography, all those sorts of things are what I see as travel photography. They're the things, uh, kind of candid photos you take while uh, traveling. Uh, but there's a lot of controversy about this uh, because there are we're being bombarded on a daily basis if we have, you know, uh, social media accounts or Instagram or something with all these very <laughs> glamorous travel shots, which um, obviously put I have up. to say are not really, um, in my mind, genuine travel shots. They're they're shots that were uh, engineered, if you will, um, uh, to sort of glamorize certain places and things and make them look great and maybe promote travel and be sold as commercial pieces and things like that. But they're not what I think of when I think of travel photography. Uh, what I think of are things that uh, you just take when you're when you're on a trip somewhere, not um, you know, not not stage things and things like that. I, I think of travel photography more in terms of documentary photography than anything else. So no less than the Photographic Society of America has defined a travel photograph as an image that expresses the feeling of a time and place portrays a land, its people, or a culture in its natural state, and I emphasize that, and has no geographical limitations. The problem with this definition is I have no idea what it means. Um, do these pictures uh, portray a land, uh, its people, or a culture in its natural state, for example? Um, is this uh, the culture and natural state 
of the residents of Lilburn, Georgia, where these two photographs were taken. So I'm not really sure what it means. Uh, I think with this uh, broad a definition, you, you would include travel photography uh, would cover just about any picture you take walking out the front door of your house, which if you want to read it that broadly, you can. But I uh, have seen this, this controversy brewing now, and there's a French photographer in Vietnam uh, who uh, kind of dove into it and, and really wanted to uh, differentiate between documentary travel photography and these made up uh, travel photographs. And he's, he said a candid image capturing a moment in time. This is his definition. A real moment, which the photographer or anyone for that matter can witness while traveling. Something that actually occurs, whether it looks authentic or not. And he elaborated on that a little bit to say what doesn't fit into this definition of travel photography, his definition, are any images that have been staged or ones that use models and props. This is what I call, quote, conceptual travel photography. But feel free to also call it fashion photography in a place far from home. Well, with no apologies to our former president, I kind of refer to these as fake views because you can see these, you know, wonderful images that are posted. And these are some that you know, he used as examples, none of which were candid, unstaged photos. I mean, if you go, and I was just obviously in Vietnam, and you see uh, the workers uh, in the incense factories building these incense uh, bundles, I, I promise you they are not uh, tall, slender models wearing all white. Uh, it doesn't really uh, lend itself well to all the dye and color involved in the, uh, the incense making. Uh, these stylized shots with sun in the background and uh, water dripping off the, the rice uh, harvest and things like that. None of these are uh, photographs that were just uh, captured by a, a casual observer when it happened. They were all set up. And yet we see these pictures all the time sort of presented to us on Instagram and things like that as, oh, hey, this is my trip to so-and-so, you know, and it's just, it's just not the case. And it's hard to draw a line, a fine line, uh, because you have a photograph like this, which some of you may have even seen it won an international uh, photography competition. Uh, I think the theme was hope. Uh, it's very reminiscent to me of um, the migrant mother photograph that we're mostly familiar with, the mother and her small children uh, during the uh, Depression, um, or the, the Dust Bowl, I, I guess, more likely. And, um, you know, kind of just trying to keep a family together. And you'd say, well, that, I mean, that's a legitimate travel photograph if somebody was traveling and they spotted this woman and took it. But when the person uh, that won, uh, it was publicized and they got $120,000 for winning this competition. Uh, somebody else who was with them at the time kind of blew the whistle and said, no, wait a minute. Um, this was a staged photograph. Um, you can see when it was taken here in the photograph on the right, uh, it was a photography tour. And uh, these photographers, they're from Malaysia, mostly, and how, you know, bus had pulled over on the side of the road, they all jumped out, they were taking pictures of the rice fields. The woman came out of that little hut over on the right and asked the leader if um, they would like her to pose for him. And of course, she was expecting to be paid for that. So she did. Nothing wrong with that. Um, you know, she needed to make a living too. Nothing wrong with them paying and taking pictures of her. You know, if that's what they want to do. But to call it a travel photograph, I think, is a bit of a stretch. I, uh, you know, if they had passed by her on the road and all jumped out and took her picture and got back on the bus and left, I'd say they've got a good argument, but not when you pay somebody to come out and be in a position and do that kind of thing. So I, I just want to kind of throw that out there as a little background um, to what I'm talking about when I talk about travel photography is documentary photography. And the most important thing, as far as I'm concerned, when you're going to do some travel photography is to set expectations. There are two kinds of trips in my world. There's a photography workshop or something you can go on where the specific purpose is to uh, photograph all day and you know travel somewhere with a group, have a guide, do all this stuff. But the goal is photography. I don't do those uh, very much, but uh, for most of us, we're doing our travel photography on trips with uh, family and spouses and things like that. So it's primarily a trip you're taking 
uh, to, to see places and or vacation or whatever. And, and photography is kind of the, the, the side benefit of it that you want to work it out. But I think it's really important if you're going to go on one of these kind of trips that you kind of work out the terms in advance. Um, you know, we don't all have spouses who enjoy standing there with us while we're waiting an hour for a particular cloud to move in just the right place. So, um, you know, I think it's always good to have an understanding going in uh, what the expectations are going to be, how much of your time is going to be spent uh, doing photography related things and uh, when that's going to be. In my case, uh, typically if I'm somewhere like on a cruise and I'm in a port somewhere and I, I'll get up early and go out and take pictures early morning, my wife will sleep in, uh, no, no issues, meet her back for a late breakfast. Um, same thing in the afternoons and things like that. But we all don't have, I mean, uh, those abilities to kind of on some trips to even set our own agenda to know where we're going to be, when we're going to be there and that sort of thing. So there's got to be a lot of uh, a give and take, I think. But I think you need to have a, an explicit conversation with whoever you're going with um, that you need some time uh, for travel photography. I'm also a big believer in, um, in planning. Even when I'm going on a trip, it's certainly not a photography trip. And it's a, a trip where, uh, well, like a cruise or something like that. Um, where you're spending every day in a port somewhere and um, you need to maximize your time. So you need to do a lot of research up front to figure out, um, you know, what the opportunities are, what the best time of day is for those kind of things. And so planning is, is really critical. And in some of you are probably like me, you know, planning a trip, researching a trip uh, for practical purposes is, is almost as much fun as the trip itself. You know, you kind of want to get into it and figure out all these little details and everything like that. I like to do that. Um, and the other reason I like to do that is because this, one of my favorite photography quotes, it's not a photography quote, quote which is from Louis Pasteur saying, chance favors the prepared mind. I mean, yes, we all uh, in travel photography hope to get lucky and see something different or interesting. The weather conditions will be just right or the, the sky will be just, just right or, or whatever. And um, a lot of that is luck. But you have to be prepared for that luck to happen when you go on trips. So the more prepared and the more planning you can do, I think, uh, the better off you're going to be. In other words, if you want to have a photograph of some famous iconic spot with a, an amazing sunset behind it or something like that, you know, you can't control whether you're going to get a sunset or not, but you can control whether you're going to be uh, somewhere where there's at the time of sunset, right? So little things make a difference in, in getting ready to uh, uh, to do this stuff. So, you know, I always, before I go anywhere, I'm, I'm, I'm a junkie for information. I like old fashioned guidebooks. Just I can, you know, scribble on or rip a page out of and things like that. I'll often buy guidebooks that are, you know, the last year's edition or something like that, because I'm going to go on the internet anyway for more recent and more current information. But there's a lot of stuff that's not going to change uh, in terms of where you want to go. Uh, I use a lot of uh, tourism websites, uh, but I do so with a real, uh, I take everything I say with a real grain of salt. I mean, I do my own research to verify things that are said there. I, I don't always trust them. Uh, but one thing I have found with TripAdvisor, if you're going on a trip somewhere and you, you don't really have a control of your agenda, but you have a free afternoon, it's sometimes good to look into the possibility of hiring a, a photography guide uh, for the afternoon or something. Uh, these aren't, you know, typically super professional types or anything necessarily, but you can do a, tour, a, 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 a Google search. You can look on TripAdvisor, just search photography tour, and you'll find a lot of variety of opportunities, some very, you know, complex, some very uh, advanced tours, but you can also find some basic ones but, you know, you just want to spend an afternoon. Um, I did this in Angkor Wat in Cambodia and found a guy that would, you know, take me around to a couple of the more off the beaten path temples uh, for an afternoon. And it worked out great. And, um, but these folks know the area, they know what time things happen. And it really gives uh, you uh, the ability to maximize your time. Um, you also need to give some thought to, you know, when you're going to go, depending on what you want to shoot. Uh, you know, we, as photographers, we don't like to shoot in crowded situations. But if you go anywhere in peak time at, um, 
you know, everybody else is going to be there too. So you're going to have to deal with that. That's certainly true for seasonal events and trying to get things timed right. Weather considerations, always an issue uh, when deciding when you're going to go shoot so you can prepare for those weather considerations. Uh, when you're going to be at particular places is something you need to give a lot of thought to. Uh, if you're going to Europe, you're going somewhere uh, in the Far East or something like that, you know, we think in terms of weekends and we think in terms of, uh, um, you know, holidays in which things like national parks are closed. <laughs> Other countries don't play by those same rules. You may find yourself somewhere on a Tuesday only to discover that, you know, this park you've really been waiting to go see uh, is not open. So you need to really look at those things. I always uh, download a sunrise, sunset table for everywhere I go for the days that I'm there. Uh, I think uh, that's something that is really useful. Um, and again, you know, verifying the opening, closing hours and things that, of places you want to go. Now, obviously, I mean, you want to go to, you know, see the bloom, the Holland, the tulip bloom in Holland. You, you, there's a window you can go. You can't be sure it's going to happen exactly at peak time, but you can kind of guess and get close enough. Uh, but there's going to be a lot of people around. Uh, and so you have to keep that in mind. Similarly, if you want to be um, in Provence in time for the uh, lavender bloom, you know, you got to know when that is <laughs> and plan accordingly. I had somebody, I did a presentation on uh, um, a photographic journey through lavender fields in Provence and and somebody wrote me and said, you know, I thought this is, this is great. I'm going to be there in in April, and I'm so looking forward to it. And, you know, I had to write them back and say, yeah, it's, you know, it's, it's great, but you're not going to see any lavender in April. And so I think they were a little disappointed, but, you know, you, you got to, you got to plan for that stuff. The other thing you have to do if you're going somewhere where you're not in total control of your schedule is ask yourself, what do you want to see above all else? I mean, what will absolutely crush your soul if you don't even get a bad picture of it to bring home? And when's the best time to see it? And uh, this, we were doing a, a cruise started in, in Rome. And of course, there's no port in Rome, but you, we, we had a day in Rome before we uh, embarked. And, but we only had a day. And you, know, you can't see Rome in a day. But I did want to go uh, you know, to the... To the uh, to, I really wanted to see, I guess, the, the church and the Vatican. And, um, you know, I, I, I just, I'm, I like to shoot architecture uh, and things like that. And so I just, you know, love to have them. And I know there's tons of limitations on shooting this. You know, I can't take my tripod in there and do all that kind of stuff. But uh, what I discovered in doing my research is that this is a picture I took from the um, sort of balcony above the entrance um, to the church. And this over on this side, you can see coming out over here, the line to get in. Now, I was told this was not a particularly long line. Comes all the way around here, comes here, up all the main steps, and into the church. But uh, th this was going to be about, a, this would be at least a two-hour wait. Well, if I only have like six hours there, I, I don't want to spend two hours in, in line. I found uh, a, a website online that allowed you to buy skip the line tickets not not a tour just a ticket that gets you past all these people now it costs nothing to go in here right and um uh, so i don't know how they've set this up but and i was a little suspicious but i read lots of reviews that said that this was legit and it was so i paid my 20 bucks I went and followed the instructions and met some guy sitting up in the portico there wearing a t-shirt and I have an open suitcase on a stool. And sure enough, he puts a little sticker on my shirt, walks me over to the front of the security line, and I just got ahead of that entire two-hour line. And I, that was the best 20 bucks I spent that day. I mean, it was well worth it. And um, because I wanted to be there uh, in the afternoon, because I wanted to try to get a couple photographs of these light rays coming through the uh, the church. And I I thought that was really uh, the best time to try because I couldn't be there you know, too late in the afternoon. I certainly couldn't be there too early in the morning. So it worked out, able to um, kind of just get in and wander around a little bit um, like everybody else, but without having to wait the two hours to get in there. Um, there. There's a 
corollary though to this you know planning and working and looking ahead and scheduling and all that and that is that you really have to be careful not to over schedule yourself um you, you know you'll be surprised to find that uh, travel times between place a and place b are a lot longer than you thought or that um you know it's it's just difficult and this is a picture i took um in the old city of jerusalem uh, we were there for a couple of days and um you know i had certain things i wanted to do but uh, this is taken in the um uh, i'm i'm blanking on names and i apologize i'm sure it's the the medicine that's uh hadrian's arch and this is the the scene where um pontius pilate delivered his whole speech you know behold the man in which he kind of presents jesus the mob and and uh there's a convent so uh, associated with this uh, and a monastery and my wife's mother attended high school last two years of high school 11th 12th grade right after world war ii at this convent and so we just happened that we were going by we but this wasn't even our schedule and we saw this and we said yeah let's go in uh we went in a little reception area and asked the lady you know we said well she went to school here is there uh somebody we could talk to and so it's that woman called the nun down and this lady comes down who did not look like any nun I've ever seen. That's her in the picture with her hand on my wife's back, you know, wearing kind of hiking shoes and, and polar tech jacket. And she was so nice. And uh, she said, you know, would you like to go into the basilica itself and light a candle for your mother's memory? And my wife was still pretty raw from losing her mother at this point. And of course, we went in there. So we're in this place that no one's in. There's not a soul there. Uh, there's a big glass wall at the back where tourists can walk by and look in. But, you know, it's only open for certain limited purposes. And so we had this unique opportunity to be in this place. Um, it's, it was very hard to photograph. It's a very tall, narrow space. I obviously didn't have a tripod or anything like that. And I, But I'd asked her, you know, can I take a few pictures? Sure, sure. And then she said, um, would you like to go to the roof? And I will tell you this, uh, the pro tip number one, uh, if anybody in any of your travels ever asks you, would you like to go to the roof? The answer is always yes. Let's go to the roof. I don't know why she wanted to take us to the roof, but there was a reason. We went up the roof and this is the dome you see in the photograph itself. And then you see the dome on the rock, gold, uh, leaf coated dome uh, mosque in the, in the in the background there and it, we just wandered around the roof it was it was the most fascinating place and i took my favorite photograph of my visit there um was this photograph that i call holy city skyline it doesn't come off as well probably in the way you're seeing it but you know it's got all the domes and churches and and things like that there's detail in the sky and i love the the combination of these old, old structures and churches and the and the satellite dishes and the hot water heaters and the, you know all there's just so much detail in this. And I never would have gotten this picture, but for sort of the serendipity of you know doing something that I hadn't planned and scheduled. So my 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 admonition to you, I guess, is um plan plan be prepared so that if something happens you're, you're ready for it be in the right place at the right time but leave yourself time for the spontaneous uh, opportunities that you'll no doubt get uh, any place you're visiting uh, that you've not been to before gear i'm not going to talk a lot about gear um but you know it's important in travel photography from my perspective to travel as light as possible I mean, I know a lot of people who are just using iPhones these days. There's nothing wrong with that. They've got remarkable uh, cameras in them. And, um, but I am very, uh, I'm, I'm still very old school. I'll use my phone and I'll tell you more about that later. But I like to use my uh, SLR as well. And, and there's still this sort of sense that, you know, you can't get as good pictures with your phone and I will tell you in some circumstances at least in my experiences you can get pictures with your phone that you never get with your SLR uh, be just because of the AI and the artificial intelligence in the in the phones that they're doing these days can account for you know bad lighting situations and everything else a lot better than your your, your regular camera can handle so 
I, I don't care what people use uh, to take the pictures. The main thing is that they actually take a camera that they will use. Uh, if you're gonna take a big heavy camera, a big heavy lens and all that kind of stuff, but you don't wanna carry it around with you when you're on a, you know excursion somewhere or doing a tour, um, then it's not gonna do you any good. The other thing is the, the, the compact iPhone, I mean, you're always gonna have your phone with you probably. And you can use your phone's camera and its GPS system to track where you took the pictures without using the cell service. So even if you don't want to use an international calling plan or something like that, you can still uh, use GPS and, uh, and, your, and your camera. The other thing, the, the, the phones allow you to take pictures of things you couldn't take otherwise. This little courtyard, I think this is in Crete. Um, I want, just want to take a picture of this courtyard. And I couldn't because there was wrought iron uh, gate in front and the, the bars were too narrow to get my uh, SLR camera lens in between them. And uh, yet, you know, the tiny little lens on the iPhone, it's real easy to, to put that in there and take a picture. The picture on the right is a picture I took on a cruise in the Norwegian Sea uh, where they had to do a, a, an evacuation of a passenger for health reasons in the middle of a storm. And the captain told, and they didn't have a landing pad on the ship, but the captain told us all to go below deck so they could deal with this procedure upstairs and, you know, in safety and all that. And so I um, heard the helicopter and I went out on the balcony and I saw the helicopter coming in and I had my phone. I mean, I, I, if I had run back to get my camera in the room, I wouldn't have been able to get the picture. And so just having my phone, having the camera on the phone ready to go, having the thing turned on with me all the time, uh, gives me the opportunity to grab those kind of spontaneous pictures that I wouldn't otherwise get. And I will say, I mean, I, this picture, I don't see I mean, either of these pictures as, you know, uh, uh, a necessarily great photograph. The one on the right gives me a chance to tell a, a pretty interesting story if I'm doing a talk about this trip or something like that. A lot of details about it that it brings back to mind. And to me, that's what travel photography is all about, is it's, you know, bringing back that adventure uh, home with you to share with other people because, you know, we're uniquely uh, privileged, a lot of us, to be able to go out and visit exotic places that most of our friends and relatives and neighbors uh, will never see. And so that, to me, is the true value of uh, travel photography. What I don't do is what this guy did. He posted this picture. This is all the stuff he took on some blah, 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 you know, and he's got camera bodies and lenses and drones and you know two different tripods and blah, blah, blah. I I would never load myself down like this I mean obviously if you're on a National Geographic photographer and you're going on an assignment to document someplace you, you do but uh, for us as a more casual photographers I try to limit myself to one camera body and uh, one good walking around lens for travel. I'll take probably three lenses on most trips, but that's it because I don't wanna weigh myself down. I don't wanna be walking around with a camera backpack on my back. I don't want a camera bag with me. I, you know, I use a, I'll talk more about it. I use a belt and pouch system. Uh, I throw a lens in a couple pouches and I'm good to go. And I, I, I don't want uh, to be weighed down. And more importantly, I don't wanna be conspicuous. And I don't want you know to stand out when I'm trying to take candid photographs. I don't want people noticing that I'm there, and uh, so I, I I I try to be very uh, uh, thoughtful about what I take. Um, you know, I don't take any fixed focal length lenses. I mean, they're great if if there's a one lens you shoot all the time. It's your favorite lens in the world. It's the way you see the world. Take it. Uh, they are great. Uh, and I don't take any of these super zooms uh, because they're usually not very sharp at either end and uh, or at high um, apertures. So I know a lot of people want to take one lens and they'll get like a 28, 300 or something like that. I, I just have not had uh, good experiences with that and I don't recommend it. I think having one good quality all around travel lens is, is the most important thing. And I think what works for that is a mid-range zoom. This is this is the one in the picture is the one I use. It's a it's a Nikon 24-120 F4. And um, you know, I'm more a wide angle shooter than anything. So having that 24 end is uh, is really uh, good for me. But the 120 gives me a little bit uh, of reach, enough for you know a good portrait lens or 
uh, you know, people lens or something like that. But if I only have one, uh, that's the lens I take. And so I encourage people get the best lens your camera manufacturer makes sort of in that range. Um, and you could take 90% of your photographs with that. I also take, uh, I will throw in my 2470 2.8 and my 70 usually, although that last one is, is a little heavy. And, uh, but that's it. I, I don't want a bunch of stuff. I, I have a way of seeing and uh, I, the subjects matters that I like to shoot don't require me to have a, a lot of glass. I'm not, I'm not, you know, if I'm not going to shoot wildlife or something like that, I don't need a long lens. Um, so I try to travel as light as possible. Now I do tell people you really need a backup. Um, it doesn't mean you have to have a backup, bat uh, backup uh, um, back uh, body uh, necessarily. I, I never had to use one. I've taken some if it's a once in a lifetime trip. And, um, but on lately and, and more frequently, I, I don't even do that anymore. I kind of use my phone as the backup if I need one. Uh, I, you know, I've got a, the latest iPhone 14 Pro, I guess. It, it takes remarkable pictures. You can shoot in raw. And, um, you know, it's not as good as a, 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 an SLR, but, you know, it, it's good enough in an emergency. Uh, but I've also, you know, had accidents with lenses and things like that on trips. And uh, you need to, to, to be prepared for that. You also, in my mind, need insurance that covers your equipment if you're taking exp more expensive stuff. Um, because, um, you know, it, it's well worth it. I've had to use it uh, multiple times. Uh, other things I think you should take with you, uh, as I said, I don't use a camera bag. Um, or a backpack or anything like that. Sometimes I'll have a vest. I can just have a few things in a couple pockets in front of me. I never put anything behind me. I often just take my belt with a couple of extra pouches that I can put, you know, a spare lens or two if I, if I need them and some, you know, a spare battery and, and memory cards and things like that. I always take memory cards. People have a lot of different philosophical views on memory cards. I don't, when I go on a trip, like this last trip, I was there, you know, for two weeks, um, I don't think I used any memory cards beyond the two that were in my camera. I, I try to be fairly selective in what photographs I'm taking, but I don't want to come back and have to process 7,000 photographs. And I also, I am more concerned about losing memory cards than um, having them malfunction on me. So if I've got two fairly large cards in my camera, um, and uh, I mean, I could probably put 5,000 uh, and those are high uh, resolution uh, uh, photographs. So in, in raw, I, and I think it works uh, just fine. I, I don't like to be taking these little cards out and replacing them and switching them around and all that kind of stuff because invariably I, I, I'm just afraid I'll, I'll lose one or something like that. So um I also, I do not have a good strategy for backing up on the road. I don't do it. I, I don't take a, yeah, I usually don't take a laptop with me and, uh, or an external hard drive or anything. And I never process on the road. So, um, you know, I, like I said, if I can keep two good size, good quality cards in my camera, I'm pretty good with that. Always take spare batteries, obviously. Um, don't fall into the routine. Some people do this. Um, you know, you put one in your, your fully charged battery in your camera, and then um, uh, every night you take it out and charge it and swap it out with the one that's been charging the night before, especially if you're using mirrorless. I've just found that they go through batteries so much faster. I, I think you need a spare battery on your person uh, every given day you're out photographing. So that means taking three. I recommend you take three. Lens cleaner, definitely want to have some uh, way to clean your lenses uh, in the field. Um, you get into all kinds of travel situations, dust and dirt and debris and everything else. So you definitely want to do that. Tripods, I, I mean, people I know are not using tripods more and more. I still take a travel tripod with me pretty much everywhere I go. Whether I use it or not, uh, you know, it's just up for... It depends on the situation of what I'm trying to photograph. Um, I, I'm using it less, I will admit, 
you know, um, I really like to use a tripod and, and for the first 30 years I was photographing things, it was always on a tripod. Um, but I mean, the, the new um, vibration reduction technology and all this stuff and high ISO performance of the newest mirrorless cameras are really pretty phenomenal. And so depending on what kind of travel you're doing, you can, you can get away without it. Um, but I, I still like to have, so even if you take a small tabletop or something, it's important. And even if you take something small enough for your phone, uh, it's a good idea because we all tend to use our phones for grab shots, but you can take some pretty spectacular uh, photographs with your phone if you have a proper platform and all of that to shoot from. And uh, always, always, always uh, take a polarizer filter for your lens. I am such a proponent of these things. I have them on the, the front of every um, you know, significant lens I use. I use them like um, uh, skylight filters because I use them so much, not, not to blue, you know, darken skies, but remove reflections and things like that. And we'll talk a little bit about that in a minute. But I think that's the one travel accessory, you know, camera accessory that you should not be without is a polarizer filter. And the other thing I really encourage people to do is take your camera mount, download the camera manual on your phone or computer or iPad, whatever you're taking with you, and have it with you. Most of us don't read our camera manuals. Uh, I don't, and um, unless I have a specific problem, but invariably I'll end up somewhere overseas and I'll need to change a setting to something else. And then I'll forget I did it. And then I can't remember how to set it back because I never use the setting that often. And I have to, I have to look it up. I may not have access to the internet, um, but if I download the, the camera manual, which most camera manufacturers provide for now, like as a PDF, on a, you know, you can even put on a Kindle or something like that. You'll you'll have it with you and uh, can go and solve any problems you might encounter. I I can't tell you how many times this has saved me. All right, enough of that. Uh, a little bit of that composition. I really think that, that it's important. I mean, good composition is important in travel photography as it is in any photography. And so there were just a couple of things I wanted to hit, particularly maybe for newer people. Um, I love this quote from Edward Weston, consulting the rules of composition before taking a photograph is like consulting the rules of gravity before taking a walk. I think what he's basically saying is, you know, you shouldn't go, okay, well, I'm gonna go out here and take some pictures. Let me go look at the, the rules for composition. Um, you know, that's crazy, but there are some concepts that if you learn them and keep them in your head, uh, when you go out to take photographs, um, they will serve you well. And the first and most important thing that most of us don't do very well, I think, is when you're taking a photograph of something, ask yourself, what is my subject? Why am I taking this photograph? And, and is this photograph conveying that, you know, desire of mine, or am I just grabbing a scene or something like that? Now, this photograph is an example. This is in the Church of the Holy Sepulcher in the old city of Jerusalem. And you can see there's a service going on. The, the priest is back here in the grotto, and you've got you know, the people out here. And then you've got the pilgrims sort of, you know, all there watching and all wrapped up and scarves and everything. And you've got this woman taking, you know, she's videotaping it or, and photographing it with her phone. Now, some people would look at this photograph and say, well, it's very busy. And, and you know, I, I wouldn't have, I, I wouldn't have, you know, I'd have waited till she put the phone down and blah, blah, blah. But for me, I was taking the photograph precisely because the woman was holding the phone up there. The, 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 the contrast sort of between this ancient, ancient service in this historic uh, church and, and uh, in, in conflict in some ways, I guess, with this modern, modern technology, uh, it, it was that contrast was what attracted me to the picture that, um, that this, this woman was you know, trying to, to record this very meaningful moment um on her phone and so she could share it with others and so that's what i wanted it that was my uh, reason for taking this photograph was because of the phone the other thing i always tell people where whatever you're photographing i don't care if it's travel or anything else try to keep your images as simple as possible uh, this was a place up in norway i i, I really was just attracted to the three boats because they were you know it was a motorboat a canoe and a kind of a dinghy rowboat three different types of boats 
I like the reflections, but everything else about this photograph is busy and distracting and all this stuff back here. And I, I just didn't really do anything. And I just, I probably stood there for, you know, 10 minutes trying to figure out what it is I really wanted to capture in this scene. And what I always try to do is reduce the scene to its simplest elements. And what I really just wanted was the sense of calm and the color in the boat and the water, uh, the dull gray of the water reflecting the overcast skies. And to, to reduce a photograph uh, to its simplest elements is really the way to, I think, to make it more powerful. And that applies in travel photography as well as anything else. Of you have standard things, leading lines. I mean, I couldn't find a more or a less subtle uh, um, example of that than this, you know, the, the lines leading to, to the cruise ship. But um, there are times when leading lines can make a difference and can help you. It's pretty obvious in this picture, you know, really what the subject is, right? It's the church, the red roof, that sort of thing. Do I need that road there leading me to the church? No, I don't. But what I do uh, like about having the leading line is that keeps you in the image because if you see the church and you kind of wander over here and you're looking at the mountains and the fog coming over the mountains and the field down here everything you do to stray from the subject sort of brings you back to the road which brings you back to the church and this idea of trying to find lines to lead to a subject um, and to keep you in a photograph is really important because our goal as photographers is to capture a moment that will uh, uh, capture people's interest that you know, it won't be just one second next, one second next, you know, look at the next picture. So it's important to, to, to find ways to do that. The rule of thirds, something you've all heard about. Uh, I never use it like intentionally. I never think of it that way. This would just happen to be a picture I took and I put the rule of thirds tic-tac-toe board over it to see, you know, sure the dog is on a PowerPoint, the doors are on either side of the other two PowerPoints and all, you know, I can tell you how this photograph sort of meets the rule of thirds where uh, you know where the elements fall in the image and it'll make a more stronger image but I, I didn't you know I wasn't consciously thinking rule of thirds when I took this photograph I think though the rule of thirds really more is the idea that you don't want your things in the middle of your frame and I think that is also something you have to be very conscious of in travel photography because sometimes when we're photographing things we've never seen before and we're out and, you know doing things you, you know, we've got that bullseye mentality we're looking through our camera and, uh, you know, our, our focus points in the center of the lens and we're, and we're just kind of shooting and, and, and we find ourselves uh, putting things in the middle uh, of the frame that it's really not so interesting. There are very few images that really justify putting the subject dead center in the middle. In the middle. That's not to say you shouldn't do it in all, in all cases. But there are some cases where it works, but in most cases it doesn't. So move the, the subject out of the center of your frame most of the time. And uh, it will help you. One of the ways I do this is I just set kind of my default uh, uh, autofocus sensor over here uh, on my camera so that it, it kind of forces me uh, in my, in, to focus uh, on something that's not in the middle rather than defaulting to always focus uh, on something that's in that bullseye middle uh, position. Uh, and that, that applies to horizons as too. Horizons too. You know, you should think about where you put a horizon when you're out. You know, here's a shot at the beach. What I want to emphasize with the clouds and the movement and the color and, and, and the connection between the two. But uh, I didn't want to put this in the center because I did want to emphasize the sky. And if I put it down here, what happens in this photograph? And you, you come into it. We read uh, left to right. You kind of follow the shoreline comes back around this way and takes you out here. These clouds are all implied leading lines bringing you down to this same point. So anywhere you go in this picture, the lines are all sending you back uh, into the center of the, uh, of the photograph as opposed to off the side somewhere. You know, it, it, it keeps the viewer's attention just a little bit more. Now there are exceptions, you know, sometimes if you want a symmetrical scene or something like that, and, and you know, you want to emphasize both the sky and the, and the Water, for example, you could put it in the middle, but in most cases, uh, you don't want to do that. The other thing, this comes up a lot in travel, just make sure you're keeping your horizon straight. Fortunately, it's something that's pretty easy to fix when you get back. Uh, you know, you can you can straighten and crop it and something like that. But, the, the, you know, then it's going to affect your composition if you have to do too much of a, 
a crop just to get your horizon straight. So watch your, I still see a lot of, in judging competitions and things like, still see a lot of uh, horizons are off that you just, it's just one little thing that you, you, you could have fixed. Um, think about whether you're gonna shoot horizontally or vertical. Uh, a lot of people kind of are in the fixed horizontal modes, the way they hold their cameras and things like that. Uh, I, I try to encourage people to turn their, <laughs> turn their camera on its side a little more often. I let the subject dictate that. You know, here obviously, uh, the, the Golden Gate Bridge. The bridge is, you know, a long structure here. I want to emphasize that length and the span. And so it, it's a natural horizontal. The picture of this old lighthouse in Barbados on the right. You know, it it screams for uh, a vertical orientation because if I shot that as a uh, as a horizontal, I just have a a ton of blank sky over here. That wouldn't be as interesting at all. So let your subject decide. Uh, here's another example. Um, what, what's your in intent in taking the picture? This is the exact same photograph, right? I've just cropped it two different ways. And on the left, I'm really kind of uh, focusing, trying to focus interest on the person, right? The, the patriarch there um, in, in the church. And, you know, I, I, it's just, I just, that's what I wanted to get. But the photograph on the right, I'm really emphasizing the weight uh, of the structure and the architecture and, and, and contrasting that with this smaller figure below. But you can see, same exact photograph, cropped two different ways, at least to me, uh, give you two very different perspectives on the same subject. So you need to think about the perspective that you're looking for. Uh, I use things like negative space to emphasize, you know, here, I put the horizon in the middle, I had equal, uh, vast empty sky, blank sky and, as water. But really, that was all done to sort of show the sort of insignificance of the of the ship in in, in all of that space and um, the, the desolation there and things like that. So use things like that. Uh, and and this one um, is you know basic. You've all been told this a thousand times. If you have something moving in your photograph, leave it room to move. Um, leave space in front of whatever direction it's going. You know, don't put the, the sailboat over here uh, with all the covering the place it's been as opposed to where it's going to go. You want the viewer to have a sense of movement. But even in that, and, and the reason this photograph, uh, I included this, this is the way uh, I think the photograph was originally taken. And because we read Again, left or right, you come in, it's obvious what the subject is, right? You see the sailboat and you see the sailboat where, where it's going. It's going over here off the screen and you go with it. But if you turn it this way, what happens? You come in left or right, you hit the sailboat, sailboat's going this way. So it sends your eye back and you keep going to go right because that's the way you read the photograph. And no matter what happens, you know, it just keeps bringing you back to the subject, keeps the viewer again in the photograph longer and gives them more opportunities to look at it and, and um, spend more time with it. So we're putting all these things together I and mean, here's kind of a rule of thirds, right? The horizon line on the upper third, a uh, leading line of this uh, rock jetty out here, uh, white sailboat, obvious subject in the picture moving um, um, right to left uh, and all three, and then the clouds and the little breaker here, all three elements that kind of form this triangle and that keep you going sort of like this. If that boat were turned around going the other direction, you'd go up there, you'd see the boat and you'd go right out of the screen. So those are concepts uh, when you formulate a, a photograph. Now I'm not sitting there you know, going, well, okay, I got my rule of thirds, I got my end, I got my leading line. But you get to a point where that's sort of intuitive and, and you feel like, okay, yeah. That's a, that, that makes sense the way I've composed that, right? A couple other little things here, impact of color. Um, obviously this is a photograph of a bunch of uh, buildings uh, in black and white. It's kind of doors and windows um, in color. It takes on a whole uh, different look. Color is more uh, the subject and impact uh, of the photograph. Here, uh, you know, just kind of a bland beach scene. Somebody nicely sets up a couple of beach umbrellas and getting ready for a, a couple hours at the beach. And suddenly you've got, again, leading lines of the clouds pushing you down to the horizon. 
a bold splash of color that uh, first captures your attention, the, the shoreline, the, the, the returns you back out to the center again. It just creates all this movement back into the photograph as opposed to taking out of it. The other thing you can do uh, by eliminating color is eliminating distractions or adding drama. You know, this church in, uh, I think this was in Mykonos, uh, that that tile sort of uh, flagstony looking uh, courtyard is was very um, colorful in a way. I think it was sort of brownish red that contrasted a lot with the white church. But I didn't want that. I really wanted uh, uh, the church and the, and the subtle sort of tones and shapes of the church. I didn't want to be distracted by that. So I convert it to black and white and eliminate those distractions. And it makes it, um, I think, more successful. Uh, for my purpose and you know and and so I I do a lot of black and white and I think a lot about that when I'm taking photographs uh, same with this this is in Venice you know these sort of god clouds coming by the storm clouds coming behind the uh, the basilica here and um, that's what I wanted to focus on I mean the church is impressive but it, it, this isn't an architectural shot obviously I mean it, it's a wide angle the, the church is sort of falling back. The lines are all leading in. Um, you know, it's, it's made no effort to make this an architectural shot. But all that falling back and leading in is to emphasize those black and the clouds coming up behind it and the light and everything else. So here's another case where taking all the color elements out of it and everything else really just added to that um, sense of drama. Uh, another compositional thing that I use a lot in... Um, in uh, travel photography is using framing or subframing to to create impact and keep a viewer in a photograph here you know this is the uh, parliament building in budapest and uh, through the columns of the fisherman's uh, uh, bastion on the other side of the river and you know i wanted to very carefully get these domes and spires in between these arches and things like that and uh capture the glow of the sunrise and and yet all these uh, arches and stonework and everything else bring a weight to the top that keep the viewer uh, keep the viewer's eyes on the subject and I think that's always a, something I look for when I'm taking photographs here you know you without the archway you'd walk down the your eyes you'd walk down the little road and you'd go up the tower and you'd go off the top of the image and you're gone the the archway holds you into the subject longer and I think that's a key thing. Another thing, and from a composition standpoint, uh, is perspective. Obviously, that's not me taking the photograph. Um, I would never get up again if I did that. But the photograph on the right, I took um, a, a church in Nuremberg. And, you know, I, it's a church that's been photographed often. But I really wanted to just get a different, a different perspective. And, and maybe people would see it in a different way um, that's a little more unique and hopefully original. And so perspective is important when you're designing your photographs. Uh, these are not, this next series, these are not my photographs, uh, but they're good examples of why perspective can make a big difference. These, these pictures are, you know, your Instagram pictures, you see them all the time. And, you know, dramatic and, you know, who goes up there and does this kind of stuff and look like they're gonna kill themselves and, you know, even if it's just a snapshot with a phone or something like that, still, you know, you've got these people risking life and limb uh, for these beautiful pictures. And uh, then you realize and you do a little exploring and find out, well, that rock's not really over anything except another, um, the ground, basically. Um, the rock's about four feet off the, uh, off the surface. So, I mean, it's, it's, there's nothing treacherous about it at all. But the perspective in the picture uh, changes all that in a very dramatic way. And as a result, you know, everybody goes and takes their picture there, but uh, you, you can see it's, it's really not at all um, what it looks like. Perspective can have that kind of impact. And the other thing you need, I think, to be uh, uh, sort of aware of is uh, making sure you take photographs that can give your viewers a sense of scale. Here are this ice front and this glacier in, uh, uh, in the Arctic. Uh, you can take a nice picture of it. You can even take an abstract picture of it. You can do whatever landscape, but without the little zodiac with the people in it at the bottom, you have no idea 
whether that's a little small thing or an enormous thing, right? So I always like in these kind of situations, travel shots, landscapes, to try to include um, something to give the viewer a, a sense of scale. All right. Now I'm going to kind of switch to the last um, part um, I, and talk about just tips and techniques. This is just a whole bunch of stuff. I'm going to talk fast um, because I think I'm a little behind schedule and um, I, I don't want to take more than my, my, my hour or whatever. But uh, these are just some sort of, many of them just sort of random things. And I think if you're going on a trip somewhere, you need to remember to do one, make a decision before you go. Am I going to set my you know, if you're using a camera as opposed to a phone that automatically sets, uh, do I want to set my camera to local time and date so that when I go back, that'll be included in the EXIF data? Um, some people always want to do that because they want to see exactly what time and day they were when they took a particular photograph. Other people say, I can't remember to do that. I don't remember to switch it back when I get home. Um, so I like to keep mine on my home time all the time. I know just to uh, if I need the time and date, uh, particularly the time, I can switch, I can convert it myself, you know, knowing the time difference. So, but think about that. I mean, you, you definitely should have something set correctly uh, for future reference so that it's captured in the exit data on your cones. Two, keep your gear clean, especially your lenses and sensors. I, I can't emphasize this enough, but I, but you all know this, but I do want to emphasize if you're using your phone substantially or as a backup or whatever, clean the lenses on the front of your phone. <clears throat> Most people don't do that. You stuff your phone in your pocket or purse or, you know, <laughs> excuse me. And um, they get banged up and dirty and everything else. So, cool. you know, I, I every day you want to take out a little lens cloth and just clean off those front lenses. It'll make a big difference in your uh, iPhone things. Three, how to use a selfie stick without being obnoxious. This is a trick question. Uh, I don't think you can, and I don't think you should. And I'm going to encourage you not to use them. Um, these things have gotten so out of hand everywhere I go lately. You know, you, you people are just swamping places with them, and you can't see, you can't get around them. They're interfering with your shots, and they're they're not safe um, in, in dangerous situations. People have been killed. Uh, trying to take selfies with these things and backing off a cliff and things like that. I just, I don't like it. I, uh, if you have to have a picture of yourself in front of something, just ask somebody to take your picture. Uh, you know, they can do it. Now I do have a corollary. Uh, well, let me, before I get there, the, the second thing I'm seeing now are these little uh, travel tripod things for iPhones or other phones uh, where people are doing their selfies, not using the handheld stick, but using these little, um, Tripods, I mean, and I can't tell you how much I secretly wanted a bus to come by and just take this guy out because he was getting in the way of everybody and he was leaving that thing there and people couldn't walk between it and him and it was just a pain. This is a picture I took of the, you know, I was taking it in the Uruguayan um, Capitol building and, and it was closed. There were not really people around. I was waiting for, you know, folks to clear out. Had my tripod set up, all ready to go. And this woman just walks right by me and sets up her little, uh, you know, selfie thing, which she's got her, you know, heavy bag on the bottom, weighing it down so it won't blow over. She's got her little mirror mounted on the top so she can see herself really well and get prepared before she takes the picture, but completely oblivious to the fact that I was standing there trying to take a picture. I was on a tripod. I mean, I was, you know, big camera, looked like I was supposed to be there, could care less. I, I just think these things, um, make it too easy for people to just be uh, rude and obnoxious and indifferent to the other people who are trying to take pictures. Now, I'm not talking about holding your camera up and taking a picture of yourself, I'm, but I'm talking about using these extensions and things. I, I just, I don't, I think you should, you know, in that situation, ask a friend to take a picture of you. Now, when you do that, you have to be careful. I uh, asked one of the expedition guides on a trip to the Arctic uh, to take this photograph with my phone of me at the, on, on an ice landing we did and I and I gave it to the guy and I the guy was kind of a crazy guy but I mean big personality type and I thought well here just you know take it just if you just take a couple of pictures make sure we get one that's good that would be fine so uh, he's over there just banging away taking pictures and I thought well this is going to be great 
you know, he'll get something in there that, that you know, is good. And uh, then he hands me the phone back. And so I go to look at them and this is what I see. He's over there with my phone pointed at me taking selfies. And not just one. I mean, he was taking lots of selfies. And then other people were getting in on the act. And pretty soon, you know, he's got the whole group behind him. And he's having a regular great time. And, you know, just bang, 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 bang. And there he is. And then, he, you know, finally, I guess he took the, the one picture of us and handed the phone back. So uh, hand your phone to people, ask them to take your picture. But, you know, keep an eye on them. Don't get them to a crazy person. That's, I guess, the bottom line. Avoid travel cliches, uh, or at least recognize them. Uh, these pictures that everybody takes the same exact picture. Um, we've seen it, you know, it's not original. Do something different. But if you can't help yourself, here's the tourist shot user manual. Tell you how to uh, position yourself with all these famous uh, outdoor uh, statues and things uh, so that you too can have your uh, cliche moment. Biggest difficulty I have in traveling, uh, if I'm not on a you know a trip that I'm managing myself or that I'm on my own, is is dealing with crowds because you don't control your agenda. Uh, you know, this is the picture people want of the Great Wall. Uh, this is the situation they confront when they get there. Uh, you know, there's nothing you can do about that, right? Uh, if you don't have any control of your schedule, but there are a few things you can do uh, to try to avoid. You know, a lot of times, like this photograph, Trevi Fountain in Rome, I, there was a bunch of people around. It was a bad time of day, but I wanted to get a picture and I didn't want a, that picture. And so I basically just, you know, kind of worked my way through the crowd and took a tighter close up that, where I could eliminate all the people and everything like that. So you can kind of position yourself. Uh, if you're on a tour, even you know, you're in a short excursion, and there's 20 of you or something on a tour. You know, I always try to get uh, either at the front of the line or the very back of the line. Uh, the front of the line, because if we're going somewhere different and, you know, <laughs> nobody's in front of us, uh, I have a better chance of sort of an unobstructed shot. Uh, at the back of the line, um, I can shoot behind us or I can wander off, which I do frequently. Uh, I mean, I try to stay within the, the general vicinity of the of the guide. And usually we have like uh, wireless uh, earpieces or whatever to hear them. Um, so I can kind of hear when the signal's getting weak and I have to catch up. But um, I, I do that. I, 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 you know, veer from the beaten path a little bit because I really like to, I like pictures. I don't like pictures of, with people in them. I, you know, I'm just not a people photographer, but I, I like to take uh, places. One thing I discovered on a recent trip uh, a couple of years ago was, uh, you know, if you're, if you're, this is Dubrovnik in Croatia and, it's crowded a lot of time. If you get there earlier in the morning, you're obviously going to generally have less crowds. So if you're on your own or something like that, try to go, um, you know, the first opportunity you can get to a place, you might have a little more luck. I've also kind of adopted this perspective thing where like in this, I'm shooting with a wide angle lens, obviously, and it was crowded, but uh, I could get a little gap every once in a while in people. By using that wide angle lens, it kind of pushes all the people uh, forward. It doesn't take, you know, a huge gap in the crowd to kind of eliminate some space. And so creating that empty space at the beginning, you know, kind of catching the archways and all that gives you more of a sense here of an uncrowded place, right, than it, than it really was and um, lessens the impact and significance of the people in the image. And if you can have a bird fly through, you know, that feels that works out well too. So leave, try that sometime. Leave yourself a little empty space. Use a wide angle lens. Shoot at an angle. You'd be surprised how you can minimize the crowds. You can do things like use long exposures if the conditions allow, and you know people walking through sort of disappear. But I find that very hard to do if I'm shooting uh, in daylight. I do a lot of what I call watchful waiting. Kind of pick a subject I want to photograph find the spot I want to photograph it from, kind of narrow in on exactly what it is I want to shoot. Uh, you can see, and, and then just kind of wait for my moment. Now I'm shooting along the way because I know I can eliminate some. I mean, this I can take this person out of the door uh, if I want to, So, but I get the shot, so I have a safety shot. But more often than not, ultimately I'll find a shot and I'll get that one little quick opportunity get the picture without the people but it does take a little 
waiting. But again, this is that idea of uh, getting lucky, um, but being prepared for it and, and working the scene. And dealing with people is hard in travel, I find. Um, this photograph was, I I'm not even sure I can tell you off the top of my head where I took this, probably Rome. Um, and I just wanted the architectural shot. And these two tourists were over here just having a conversation. They weren't talking about anything in the church. They weren't, uh, you know, looking at anything in the church. They were just having a conversation. I'm sitting there. I have a tripod here. I got my camera all set up. I'm the only one there. And, you know, I, I kind of coughed and one of them looked over and I just did the, you know, could, could, could you just move over a couple feet? And they were happy to do it. Uh, you know, they, they didn't care where they were standing and uh, they didn't realize I was there. And so I, I, I will do that often. I mean, I'm not going to tell the whole crowd, but if there's just one or two persons there that I need to get out, um, I ask and usually they'll do it. Um, I don't take pictures of people a lot. I'm not a people photographer at all, but if I do take pictures of people, uh, it, they're just candids and, and I try to take pictures where people are interacting, not kind of portraits and things like that. So I want to get a maybe a, a grab shot or something of, of something happening. Uh, or, you know, if they're action or adventure kind of shots or something like that, people doing things. Um, uh, so I think I, I'm sort of on the lookout that, for that once in a while. Um, I get asked a lot, you know, do you ask people if you can photograph them? No. Uh, I, I might in a situation where I needed to, but if I asked this person if I could photograph them in the middle of this uh, moment in a church, deep in uh, you know prayer or whatever uh, i'm going to kind of ruin the, the moment so I, I don't do that um i wouldn't ask these people either i mean i wanted to take this photograph because i thought it was humorous they're sitting out there on the pool deck on a cruise ship ocean behind them beautiful day and uh, both on their phones and I, I thought that picture said something about the way we travel and things like that. But I, if I went and asked them if I could take their picture, I, I wouldn't get that photograph. And I don't really care because I'm not selling these photographs. I'm taking them for myself and um, I, I'm not a commercial photographer. I don't need model releases or any of that kind of stuff. You know, I, 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 it's just not something I need to do. And if you're taking pictures of performers, places and things like that, street performers and whatever, well, I think they're all fair game. I mean, that's why they're performing. They want attention. Uh, you know, they want you to give them some money, which I would do if I spend any amount of time photographing somebody and, uh, you know, throw a bucket, a dollar in the bucket or something like that. But, you know, th they generally don't care um, if you take their photograph. But the one thing I'll have to say, and this drives me crazy, if you look like a photographer, People will always be asking you to take their picture. And I understand that. People are always shoving a camera in my hand saying, could you take our picture? Thinking that, you know, maybe I'm going to do some spectacular thing that, that they couldn't do, which I can't. But the ones I don't understand, this couple, for instance, this was in Vienna. It came up to me and, you know, I'm carrying around my tripod and doing my usual thing. And, and they wanted me to take their picture. I was like, okay. I mean, it's not a very nice, but he sure took their picture. And then they just said thanks and walked off and i thought i thought they're going to give me a you know an email address or i need to send a picture or something no, they just want me to take their picture very strange uh photographing through glass uh is something that happens to us on tours and things like that a lot uh just get your camera lens as close to the glass as possible if i'm on a bus or something and i'm using my phone i'll just put it flat up against the window uh you just have to try to avoid glare and reflections in the glass so you need to be right up against it uh, this is a place where a polarizing filter will help you also. Um, here, the, this, this, this uh, Michelangelo is behind very thick and very dirty uh, polar. Uh, Lexan glass, bulletproof glass, you know, people put their hands all over it, kids put their noses up against it. It's kind of a mess. The lighting in there is bad, but a polarizing filter can eliminate a lot of that. Yeah, if you want to take a picture of somebody else's art, it, in addition, as I said, of giving you these, you know, darker skies and in inappropriate circumstances, uh, it will also eliminate reflections in glass and, and things like that, especially and water and things like that. So I always use them. You can even get them for your phone, a little clip on filter, put on the lens. I tend to go old school, just use my polarized sunglasses that I'm wearing, put the uh, iPhone lens right up against the 
inside of the glasses at the center and fire away. Uh, I always start wide when I uh, approach a new location and work my way in. Uh, these are the Lofoten Islands in Norway, and you know, I like the little harbor, uh, the yellow buildings, you know, but I want to get it, you know, if I'm, when I first get there, it's usually my best opportunity to get kind of a wide shot uh, without too many people in it. And then, uh, then I can work the details where I don't have to worry about people. So if I'm more interested really in the yellow building and the reflections in the water or something like that, or, you know, I see these birds nesting over here. So I might want to go over and take some detail shots and things like that. No person's going to get in the way of me taking this. I don't have to worry about it. So take the establishing shots first then work into the details where you don't have to worry about people wandering into your photograph. Another thing, um, there are reasons that postcards are postcards. People often will look at a picture and say, oh, that just looks like a postcard, as if there's something wrong with that if you're you know, a, a professional photographer or something. I think that's crazy. There are reasons that postcards are postcards. People want to see those photographs. I always take sort of a postcard uh, vantage point on pictures if it presents itself. I, I'm not snobby about that at all. Um, but I do encourage people then to get off the beaten path and get a few streets off and find more interesting pictures. This was the, the Rasta car wash. You can see yeah, there's a different variety of beer can on every fence post. Guy up here is painting his graffiti. Um, all sorts of interesting stories in the photograph um, and certainly not a postcard. If you go somewhere that has a wall walk, which a lot of the old cities in Europe uh, do, uh, I always carry encourage people to take that. You always get interesting vantage points from above. And these are also opportunities to eliminate people. Uh, I always say, you know, take pictures to show people how you got there. If it was something interesting, this was from a raft trip down the Colorado River. You know, people wanted to know lots of, had lots of questions about the logistics of that. And so to show them. Now that doesn't mean you need to take every picture of you know, every Delta airplane you board. I'm not saying you should do that. But if there's an interesting uh, mode of transportation, uh, or that's different uh, that you took and, and, and from which you took your pictures and things like that, it's good to let people see that and uh, uh, know what the conditions were like. Uh, include iconic elements to show your locale. This is something I'd always uh, encourage people to do. Obviously, Holland, you know, you, if you're going to show people, share pictures of Holland, you, you better have a windmill in there. If you don't have a tulip, you better have something that's iconic. Uh, this photograph in New York City, you know, I just kind of thought it was a classic, all the yellow movement of the yellow calves, but the NYPD car sitting right there in front under the statue of Atlas at Rockefeller Center, American flag up in the upper left corner. All those elements kind of tell you exactly, uh, you know, where the photograph was taken. If you don't have iconic identifiers at a location you're shooting, try to find an interesting sign. Uh, the left, that's Ushuaia, the southernmost city in the world in Patagonia or Argentina. Uh, and at the, at the tip, most uh, the jumping off place for most Antarctic expeditions, then this little handmade sign, welcome to Kodar uh, in, uh, on, the, on the west coast, or uh, the east uh, coast of the Mediterranean. And, uh, you know, it was the most interesting sign I could find to say where I was. Signs are great to help you remember where you were. I always take pictures of signs in locations for later reference. If I don't. If my phone is not my primary camera for a particular shot, I always try to use my phone and take a picture anyway to make sure I'm getting the GPS for recording locations. Now I can go back and kind of match them up with the pictures I'm taking with my big camera. I know there are GPS uh, devices and things like that I can add to my camera, but I just find this to be much easier just to use my phone because I typically will take some uh, grab shots with my phone even if I'm taking shots with my big camera anyway. Uh, pay attention to signs uh, where you're traveling. Everybody has different rules about what you can shoot and what you can't. Um, I always try to find out in advance what's acceptable if I can, but if I can't, uh, read the signs carefully. My rule is if the sign is ambiguous, I read it most favorably to me and assume that somebody will come tell me I'm violating the rules. Uh, for example, you know, this sign on the upper left, no flash photography, but the sign itself looks like just no photography, right? Um, the, the sign down here on the lower left, I read that to mean no flash on your phone photography. 
that's, I mean, that's what that is. That's a phone with a flash turned on. That's telling me I can use my phone, but without the flash on. That's my reading of it. This one in the bottom middle is pretty unambiguous. Uh, no photography at all. The one on the lower right, I take that to mean no tripod, not no photography. And the upper left, I take that one to mean, no, again, no flash on them, but you can take photographs with any kind of camera. Uh, there, those all mean very different things. And um, I, I, as I said, I construe them in my favor. Uh, speaking of signs, I love to take pictures of, of weird signs in places that are slightly unusual. Um, I don't know what this means. I don't know how one indiscriminately relieves themselves in this or any other area, but um, that seems like quite a problem to have that you'd have to make a sign and find people a hundred dollars or signs telling you how to use your toilet, you know, not to stand on it. And I guess use it as a squat toilet. Uh, these particular signs were actually in a bathroom in uh, Yellowstone. <laughs> so uh, that was not an exotic overseas sign. That was a local. Uh, bathrooms, if you're going somewhere unusual, people do like to know about these things. If you're doing a travel program or something, uh, this is the bathroom facility for our raft trip, week-long raft trip down the uh, Colorado. Um, this picture generates more discussion than many of my photographs, uh, just among people who want to know more about the trip and the logistics of the trip. Uh, they generally particularly want to know what the purpose of the PAM spray is, and I'll, I'll leave that to you all to figure out. Um, Always in your travel photography, try to create a sense of place uh, on, the, on the left, the sort of contrast between the, the, uh, the Arab, the old Arab market uh, quarter in Jerusalem and, you know, the Nike uh, onesie for kids up here. I just think it shows a different uh, interest uh, here. It's pretty obvious where these folks are, the Wailing Wall and uh, um, kids going back to school and things like that gives you a, a sense of place. A uh, photograph, of course, unique local wildlife. These are just some horses, Icelandic horses, walrus you don't see every day out in the wild. Um, capture culture and food. Uh, that's a big part of travel photography. Uh, I always check local calendars for any place I'm going to see if there are any special events I want to participate in. I almost always, if I can find an interesting cemetery, go because I, I find them fascinating, both culturally and uh, historically and uh, architecturally and things like that. Uh, this little uh, cemetery on the right uh, was in Punta Arenas, Chile. Had the weirdest topiary and trees and, and hedges and things like that. And it was just fascinating to walk through there. Um, expect the unexpected when you're traveling. Of course, this was a little boat out in the river in Budapest that started firing off fireworks. And I just took this picture from the balcony of our cabin. I didn't know that was going to happen, but generally if I'm on a ship or something like that, I always leave my camera on a tripod um, ready to go so I can just grab it, turn it on and jump out and use it as I did in this case. Um, and we were in Iceland in early September, no expectation to see uh, uh, the night lights and and I uh, just happened to be in a place where going to bed about 11.30 at night, I looked out the window and it looked like fog coming in. So I, I just threw my coat on and grabbed my camera that was already on the tripod and ran out in the parking lot, took a, a couple of long exposures. Um, and um, this was the only time we saw this on the trip. And uh, I didn't have anything great to put in the foreground or anything, but I got some interesting pictures of the Aurora and, um, something I wasn't even expecting to photograph. But as much as expecting the unexpected, you need to expect the expected. This is again, the planning. Uh, we were crossing the Arctic Circle. I knew there was a marker uh, where we would cross here that would show uh, the Arctic Circle. And I wanted to be sure and get just, it just a, you know, a grab shot and um, ask the people on the ship, you know, can you point out where that will be? What time of day we're expecting to go by it? And, and that sort of thing. And they were happy to, to get that information from the captain. So, uh, you know, look for things like that. And finally, and I'm, I'm wrapping up here, I know I'm a couple of minutes over, I think, uh, a word about safety. This is not my photograph. Uh, we tend to get wrapped up in travels though, and not uh, always thinking about our environment, uh, our own safety, you know, sometimes a picture we wanna get uh, kind of has us so focused, we don't know what's going on around us. 
uh, we're always at risk of losing gear and equipment and things like that, bags, personal items. Um, but the point is, uh, when you're out doing travel photography, don't take unnecessary risks. Don't do stupid things just to get a photograph. Keep your wits about you uh, all the time so you are not so distracted that you're not aware of what's happening in an otherwise strange uh, and different environment. So I'm going to leave you with three parting shots, thoughts, I should say. The first, in your travel photography, don't photograph everything you see from the moment you get off the plane until you arrive back home. I see people doing this all the time, thousands of photographs, but think about what you're photographing and why, and take the time to take meaningful photographs uh, that won't cost you hours and hours of culling and sorting later when you get back. Uh, but if you do that, please don't come back and share them with everybody else. I love this headline from the New York Times, the tyranny of other people's vacation photos. Now everybody has a camera. Now everybody is, is sharing their you know, travels with you in real time on Facebook or whatever. And you know, nobody's giving any thought to editing and, or any of that kind of stuff. Um, I always tell people, I, if I go on a week long trip somewhere, multiple locations or whatever, you know, if, if I end up with maybe 50 photographs I can share, um, I consider that a lot. Um, and I'm talking here about, you know, even just coming back and sharing your fam uh, with family and friends and things like that. Uh, do some significant uh, calling and editing and save the best. This is particularly true with landscapes and scenics. We all go to these places and they're terrific. And, but, you know, pick your best two or three shots. Don't show a hundred pictures of the same lake and canoes and just different variations of the theme. You bore people to tears. Uh, same with city skylines and things like that. Take one picture that you like, uh, you know, maybe share it, and uh, but not 20 of the same thing. It's, it'll, it'll drive people crazy. Parting thought number two, don't miss the experience just to get the photograph. I, I see this happening so many times. Uh, these people were, uh, I think, from Korea. They were doing the uh, walking the stations of the cross in the old city. And you see the woman in the back carrying the cross has got her phone out and she's either video or, or taking pictures or, or whatever. I don't know. But she's spending more time concentrating on her phone than she is on the historic and, and I assume in these people's case, very uh, personal uh, uh, experience of doing this walk all in the name of just trying to capture photographs. That's a mistake. The things that we really remember, the things that impact us the most are the things that we you know, fully experience uh, and, and you capture those memories in your mind, then take the picture. It's sort of like the people who rush to the national parks, jump out at every turnout, take a picture and jump back in and go. You know, they're not, they're missing the experience just so they can say they were there and have a photograph. Don't uh, be one of those people. And finally, third, if you want to be a better photographer, this is a better, better favorite quote of mine. If you want to be a better photographer, stand in front of more interesting stuff. And that's the truth, right? I mean, that's the goal. Most of us as travel photographers is to find interesting things to photograph, to bring back and share with others. Well, I hope that was interesting and, and, and uh, hopefully a little informative. Again, I apologize for the, uh, uh, if my voice is giving out and, and, uh, or less than clear, um, but uh, I'm gonna get over this as quick as I can. I'm gonna stop this. If anybody has any questions or anything, I'm happy to, to try and answer them. Or is everybody asleep? No, we're not asleep. I was uh, enjoying the pictures and the and the tips and on what we should be doing and why we should be doing it. Because there's a lot of us that like to travel. I'm one of them. But uh, I was good. Thank you. Thank you so much, Jeff. Anybody else got any questions now? Uh, great job. Thank you. Thank you. I have a question for you. Um, yeah. I know you had talked about, um, oh, you know, a lot of places are full of crowded, you know, they're crowded with all kinds of people. Do you use neuro uh, neutral density filters sometimes with long exposures to try and get them out? I really don't. Um, I, I have uh, variable neutral density filters that I can kind of dial in. <laughs> Sorry, a certain amount of that. I, I don't like the effect a lot in, uh, in daytime, you know, sometimes it helps with some water shots or beach shots or something like that. 
but um, if it's a really crowded place, it's got to be a really long uh, exposure to effectively remove people. And even when you do that, you sometimes still get that kind of a, a ghosty blur of movement. And uh, I, I, you know, I prefer to not have people if I can uh, avoid them. Um, by using some other technique than that. But it, it is something you can certainly do. I mean, you can try, but you know, you're talking probably a 10 stop neutral density filter or something like that, depending on the light situation, the time of day. And um, that makes it hard to focus and to see through your camera and, and expose. And I don't know, it's just, to me, it's not really worth it. It takes a lot of effort and time. Mm, thank you. Mm -hmm. Anybody else? Well, Jeff, I'm 